We've reached our last presentation of Comfish Alaska 2021. So I wanna take a moment to again, thank all of our presenters, our exhibitors and attendees for having this virtual experience with us. The Kodiak Chamber of Commerce really was committed to bringing critical information and exhibitor options to our commercial fisheries community. And we're proud to have done so. We look forward to meeting everyone again next year, but we really hope we can be in person instead. So our last forum is updates from both the Alaska Fisheries Science Center and the crab research at the Near Island NOAA Lab. And those are with those presentations are with Bob Foy and Mike Litzow. Those joining us on Hopin, please remember you can submit your questions at any point in time during the presentation through the chat function or the Q&A function, whichever one is working best for you. So we'll go ahead and start off by introducing uh, Mike Litzow, who is the fisheries oceanographer and director of the NOAA Fisheries Lab in Kodiak, Alaska. His research focuses on large scale patterns of atmosphere and ocean change and how they affect Alaskan fisheries. Thanks so much for joining us, Mike. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, yeah, appreciate the invite. Um, I'm very excited to talk to everyone today about the uh, Alaska Fisheries Science Center Lab at uh, Near Island in Kodiak. As Sarah said, I, I'm recently the director. I've been the director of the lab for about a year and a half. And I think it's a real feather in the cap of Kodiak to have a, a research program like this in a fishing town like ours. So we are mostly, though not entirely, let me see if I can advance here. Mostly, but uh, not entirely, a uh, shellfish crab fishery oriented program. And the reason that the, the NOAA Crab Fisheries Science Program is in Kodiak has to do with the history of Kodiak as a fishing town. So our program's been here since the 1970s. And in beginning in the 1950s and certainly in the 1960s and 1970s, Kodiak was really identified with crab, king crab in particular. King crab was the mainstay of this town. It was the third um, big fisheries boom in the history of Alaska. We started off with cod in the Gulf of Alaska in the uh, late 19th century. That was followed by uh, salmon shortly thereafter. And then beginning in the 1950s, there's this huge king crab boom. And so that's why there's a, a crab fisheries uh, research program located here in Kodiak. But of course, we're not a king crab fishing town anymore. And that's really the sort of the big story of this lab and how long this lab has been here is that really the story of fisheries in Alaska is the story of, of change over time. And that's illustrated by this plot. This is just a time series of how much king crab we've taken out of Gulf of Alaska waters through commercial fisheries going back to the 1950s. So every dot is the total catch in millions of pounds in an individual year. You can see we started off in the 1950s in an exploratory sort of way and then the fishery quickly boomed up to almost 100 million pounds of crab in one year and then oh i see sarah do you you don't have my slides we we can't see them right now if you want to go ahead and try and share your screen again ah there we go how's that oh. still still not yet there, I think we're getting it now. Okay, it worked great in, uh, in practice, right? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead and try right now. We're getting a whole bunch of screens at once. Uh-oh, okay. But again, this is why we have backup. <laughs> that looks better to me. How's that look to you? We've got it now, thank you. All right, great. All right, thanks for stopping me there. So anyway, we were a, a, a king crab fishing town here and the king crab went away in the Gulf, but king crab never went away and other crab fisheries never went away in the Bering Sea. So over time, the Bering Sea has become the focus of our program. Um, so that history in the Bering Sea is illustrated here in this plot where we're just looking at commercial fisheries through time, uh, both for red king crab in red, and then this other really important crab fishery in the Bering Sea snow crab in blue. So just as was the case in the Gulf, um, there was a huge buildup in king crab fisheries in the Bering and then a crash in the early 1980s, but that fishery never went away. It's been maintained at a lower but much steadier level uh, ever since. 
And then snow crab fisheries, as I said, have been a real success. We had this big boom, and then that dropped off a bit, but it remains a really important viable fishery. Um, so those two fisheries are a real focus of our program. And if you think about what we didn't have in the early 1980s when we had these collapses in crab fisheries before, we didn't have good fisheries management. We didn't have good estimates of how much crab was out there to be caught. And so a big focus of our program is we go out every year to the Bering Sea and we participate in this bottom trawl survey where we're working on chartered commercial vessels and we um, uh, sample in a, in a standardized way across this grid, across the Bering Sea and estimate the biomass of crabs and fish that are available to be caught. And those are the numbers that go into the, the population models that help to set sustainable quotas for, for fishing. So these uh, surveys began in the 1950s in an exploratory way. They've been going on continuously since 1972 and in a standardized fashion since 1982. And they've been happening every year except for last year uh, when we had COVID and we couldn't get out. So we're really looking forward to getting out this summer and getting the time series going again and providing those numbers for management of fisheries. And then the other important thing to notice about this plot is that dashed line in that area in the northern Bering Sea that never used to be important to, to the Bering Sea fisheries. But as we've seen the Bering Sea changing so quickly, we're seeing fish populations move up north really rapidly, and we're starting to sample up there as well. So those surveys are an important part of, of our mission. And as I said at the outset, we're mostly a crab-focused group, but there are also ground fish biologists who are stationed here in Kodiak. They work on similar surveys in the Gulf of Alaska and the Aleutian Islands to estimate groundfish biomass. And then we also have a number of people, both locally and from elsewhere in the Alaska Center, who are working on fisheries research related to, to, um, to groundfish issues, like these guys on the right, who are studying tiny little Pacific cod, trying to understand the dynamics affecting that population that, of course, has been so much in the news and such a big deal for us here in Kodiak. So in addition to those surveys, we've got a number of really cool research programs that are going on at our lab that are focused on these really, um, how to put it, like these really direct management payoffs. We're, we're conducting science, conducting research that improves our ability to manage crab stocks in particular. So this is a, a project that's been led, led by Leah Zacker, who's a biologist in our program. Um, and it has to do with getting better information about the location of crabs on the Bering Sea shelf. So we've got good data on where crabs are in the summertime when our surveys occur, but not such good data outside of that time of year. And in particular, there's a no trawl area that's set up in the Bering Sea to protect king crab, but we don't have great information as to, to how important that area really is to king crab during trawling season, and if, if that's the habitat area that, cra that crabs are using. So Leah is working with the Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation, which is an industry group working with collaborators at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game to put out these acoustic tags on red king crab in the Bering. And then um, uh, we're renting time on these sail drones, these autonomous wind-driven drones that can then go out and sample a pattern across the Bering Sea and recite, as it were, these tagged crab and see how they move over time. And in particular, see how they're using this um, trawl exclusion area in the red square to see how bycatch measures are actually working out on the grounds. And this research also gives us great information about habitat use by different age classes of crab throughout the year. And that's particularly important as the Bering Sea is changing so quickly. Um, this program is going on right now. There's a sail drone out sampling crabs as we speak, and Leah is going to be going out in the fall to tag more crabs for this research. Then another really, um, how to put it, like um, another sort of shiny asset that we have at the lab is we've got this great flow through seawater research facility in the first floor of the building. So there's a lot of physiological and behavioral questions have to do with crab and fish that you can't really get at in the field. We've got this great facility where we can hold captive animals and experiment on them and get at these, these other sorts of things that are more difficult to get in a field setting. So as an example, 
with that kind of research, uh, there's this program that's been led by Aaron Fidua, oops, who's another, um, another crab biologist in our group, getting better estimates of how much crabs grow each time they molt. So this turns out to be really important. So you can estimate the number of crabs or the number of fish in a population in, in numbers, of how many crabs are out there in the Bering Sea. But then you have to set quotas in units of pounds, in units of weight. So you have to translate numbers to, to weight to, for management purposes. For fish, that's one thing, because fish grow every day. They grow continuously, and it's, it's fairly easy to model how fast they grow. But for crab, it's more complicated, because they only grow when they molt. And so they grow in this stepwise fashion with each molt. And so Aaron, again, in collaboration with industry, in collaboration with Fish and Game, uh, goes out and collects snow crab in the winter um, before, or late winter, early spring, before they molt, and then brings them back to the lab. Um, measures the growth increment that occurs with each molt, and then that plugs into the population models that are used for management. And that's the kind of research that allows us to get more precise uh, estimates of, or, or more precisely set quotas for sustainable management. And Aaron's actually out in the bearing right now. As I said a while ago, the story of Alaskan fisheries is really a story of change. We know there's more change coming. Um, a particular issue for calcifying organisms such as crab or such as shellfish is this issue of ocean acidification. So a third of the carbon dioxide that people have put into the atmosphere has been taken up by the ocean. And when you add carbon dioxide to ocean water, you change the chemistry in a way that reduces the pH, makes the ocean ever so slightly more acidic. That has real implications for calcifying organisms because it makes seawater more corrosive to calcium. So there's a lot of interest in what the, what the uh, effects of this change will be on commercially important crab stocks. And um, you can think in terms of direct effects about acidification, just killing animals outright, or indirect effects, you know, making, making shells softer so that animals can't feed as well, or, or a reduction to, uh, to prey items that are also dependent on on calcification. And then there are these interactive effects with temperature and other environmental variables that make understanding the consequences of acidification for our fisheries quite a difficult task. So we've got this great longstanding program that's been led by Chris Long, another biologist in our group, where we're able to, or he's able to raise crabs under uh, precise conditions of acidification in the lab and then look at what the effects are on different species, different life history stages. And then we can take the numbers that he and his colleagues are generating in the lab and then build those out into population models that tell us what, what the trajectories of, of these fisheries are likely to be in, in coming decades. And then just briefly, I'll say that we're continuing to look at, at issues of ongoing climate change in the Bering Sea. Um, as I noted earlier, the Bering's changing so rapidly, and we're, that's illustrated here by this plot where we're looking at the total ice cover in the Bering Sea every winter from 2006 to this winter. Earlier winters were in gray, and then those colored lines are the more recent winters. And you can see we're transitioning really rapidly to this lower ice state as, as the Bering Sea is transitioning away from being a seasonally ice covered um, ecosystem. That has huge consequences, potentially, um, most likely, for crabs and other important, commercially important stocks. So as an example, if we look at that Bristol Bay, Bristol Bay Red King crab stock, and we look at the ability of that population to produce more crabs to support the fishery, that ability has been going down gradually through the years. So this plot is just a, it's a plot of how many young crabs are produced each year by the population. And it turns out that, that that population has not had a good recruitment event, not had a good year of production of young crabs for about 15 years now. And we really don't understand the reasons for that change. We need to understand those better to help manage change, help manage fisheries as the Bering Sea changes, and help support fishing economies in Alaska. So with the, the time series that we have built up by our program and our collaborators and the expertise that we have on shellfish, in our group, we're really well poised to, to lead the research on questions like this. Uh, another sort of current issue that we're really paying attention to has to do with that snow crab stock 
in the Bering Sea. So as I said earlier, snow crab are a super important fishery for Alaska. It's generally a very healthy fishery. The population's been doing well. The population's been producing young crabs that support uh, commercial exploitation. But then when we went out on our survey in 2019, we had this really sort of surprising outcome. So this is at the end of a, norm, a number of very warm years, very low ice years. And all of a sudden, the, the abundance of the smaller crabs went down quite dramatically in the Eastern Barents Sea and, and to a certain extent in the Northern Barents Sea as well. So we're really eager to get out this year and to see if these numbers hold up or if they were an anomaly. And you know, sometimes you get sort of random events in your sampling that, that might not reflect what the population is really doing. So we need some more data to, to ascertain if this is a real pattern in the population. But more than that, we really need a capability to explain why populations might be responding like this as the Bering Sea changes. And so that's a, that's a focus for our research going forward. And then finally, I just wanted to, uh, to note that a real, um, I keep on wanting to say a feather in the cap, but a real, a real high point of, of the facility is the aquarium and touch tank that we have that's open to the public. Uh, this is co-hosted by the Kodiak Island Borough, who uh, is the owner of the facility, owner of the building that we're in. And this aquarium and touch tank is just a great resource for the town of Kodiak. You know, families bring their kids in all the time. School groups are going through all the time. Um, Kodiak residents bring their off-island family who are visiting in to see, see the animals, you know, that, that are around in our waters. We get cruise ships coming through. All that's been closed down by COVID, but we've taken the chance to uh, clean up the tanks, to revitalize the displays and get everything looking spiffy again. So we're really looking forward to getting people back in the lab. And we'll certainly make a, a big announcement um, throughout town, you know, whenever that bright, shining day comes and, and we're able to sort of resume normal operations after COVID. So with that, that's all I had, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Mike. We'll go ahead and move on to our next presentation with Bob Foy, who is the director of the NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center. He has spent over 25 years conducting marine biological oceanop oceanographic and ecological research and 12 years working on stock assessment and fisheries management. He has participated in and led numerous cooperative research programs with agencies, coastal communities, and commercial industries. He currently re resides in Juneau, Alaska after leading University of Alaska and NOAA Fisheries Research Programs in Kodiak, Alaska for 17 years. Please welcome Bob Boy. Hey, Sarah, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, great to be presenting, uh, hopefully to lots of folks in Kodiak. Uh, certainly miss being in Kodiak. And, and thanks, Mike, for a, a great presentation on the Kodiak Laboratory. It's, it's great to see the continued uh, successful research and representation in that community. So today, um, for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to focus on some of the other surveys and research programs within the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. The overall uh, mission of the Science Center is to be, um, is to conduct science, be the stewards of uh, Alaska's EEZ, and those are federal waters, about 1.5 million square nautical miles. And that encompasses five large marine ecosystems. And what does that mean? Our large marine ecosystem is often defined by its physical characteristics of oceanography, uh, biological characteristics of the ecosystem. But what it means is that we've got five very different ecosystems in the marine environment around Alaska uh, that we are responsible for um, assessing, monitoring, managing from a healthy marine ecosystem perspective. So that means knowing um, how the ecosystem interacts with changes that we're seeing in the environment. Um, and then using that information uh, to support ecosystem-based fisheries management. And that is to manage our fishery stocks and our crab stocks and, and do so with an understanding of what's happening in the entire marine environment. And as Mike showed, that can be quite complex relative to what's going on with the environment in particular species. 
And then lastly, conservation of protected resources. I'll show a slide here um, that identifies some of the marine mammal species that we're also monitoring, assessing, and, and providing management um, advice for. Whoop, looking way too fast. Okay, uh, so just a, a brief overview of the types of surveys that we conduct throughout Alaska. This shows our stock assessment surveys. So these are the surveys where data is collected um, and are provided directly to stock assessments uh, for the management of, of our um, uh, living marine resources. You can see on the left-hand side, our bottom trawl surveys. Uh, this shows the slope survey in the Bering Sea and then the darker yellow. Uh, you can see all the different stations that we've occupied for over 50 years in the Bering Sea and around the Pribilof Islands and St. Matthew. Uh, more recently, a focus on the northern Bering Sea. You can see more uh, spaced stations that we have occupied in the northern Bering Sea for our bottom trawl surveys in, in the Gulf of Alaska and the Aleutian Islands as well. Quite a large area. Our acoustic midwater surveys. So these are the surveys that we uh, usually conduct aboard the, the NOAA vessel, Oscar Dyson. Uh, these are uh, conducted with acoustics in order to assess what's in the uh, midwater, what's in the water column and the biomass of fish such as Pollock uh, in the Shelikoff region or other areas in the Gulf of Alaska and in the Bering Sea. And then lastly, our long line surveys. So these are our deeper survey along this. This is our deeper survey along the slope. Uh, our long line survey that helps us uh, get a better understanding of some of the larger, deeper species uh, along the slope in the uh, North Pacific and the Gulf of Alaska, as well as the Bering Sea. You can see here a couple of the vessels that we use, the Dyson. Um, we charter uh, contract vessels uh, for some of our other work. And in some cases, I'll speak to this in a moment, we use the, the sail drones, uh, similar to the sail drones that Mike mentioned for the crab tagging research. We also conduct ecosystem surveys. Our goal with the ecosystem survey, and the reason we separate them from um, our other surveys, really all our surveys are ecosystem surveys, but these are specially focused um, to look at and collect information on uh, early life history stages or lower trophic levels, such as the plankton. Um, we uh, co-collect information on the oceanography on these, uh, these surveys. So you can see the surveys here in and around uh, the Kodiak Archipelago that happen uh, once or twice a year. We've got surveys uh, throughout the Bering Sea at different times of the year, uh, as well as uh, the Chukchi Sea. And as uh, climate, change affects the environment, st environmental stability in the, in the Northern Bering Sea, we see many of our commercial species moving into the Northern Bering Sea and moving into the Chukchi Sea. Uh, so we do our best to uh, monitor the ecosystems in those regions. This is uh, a large slide with lots of information, uh, just to show that we also have a very large footprint on marine mammal monitoring, uh, whether it's ice seals, um, up north on the North Slope, or uh, whales, uh, uh, bowhead whales um, out of Utkiagvik or Northwest Alaska, fur seals on the Pribilof Islands, stellar sea lions, uh, harbor seals, harbor porpoises, or large whales. Uh, we've got a large footprint throughout federal waters and marine waters in Alaska uh, trying to assess monitor, better understand the ecosystem role that these species have um, throughout Alaska. We use a number of different tools in order to do that. We used a fixed wing aircraft. We've used more recently hexacopters where we can go out and, and um, replace what we used to have to do by hand and, and collect information without disturbing animals. We're also using molecular techniques such as eDNA, where we can collect information to better understand uh, the density of species in a region uh, without collecting specific data. So I really wanted to focus today on how we've uh, mitigated some of the challenges in uh, 2020 and 2021. And uh, we all know what the, the major challenge there is um, relative to the pandemic. And uh, that had far reaching 
uh, effects on our mission and our ability to support communities like Kodiak and other communities throughout Alaska uh, in conducting the surveys uh, that I just showed. So our number one goal was to make sure that we could keep our staff safe, keep communities safe. We have a lot of our staff coming in and out of communities in order to collect data. Um, with the ultimate goal of doing whatever we could to provide those data services so that we could continue to manage um, the fisheries and monitor our ecosystems. At the same time, our old challenges didn't go away this year. Uh, we're still dealing with survey expansion. We're moving uh, because of climate change and environmental shifts. We're moving a focus into the Northern Bering Sea. So we're trying to take our static resources and uh, focus farther north. Uh, this is the equivalent of, of suddenly needing to cover an area the size of Colorado. Um, and uh, so it's not a minor effort uh, that we're trying to expand into in the Northern Bering Sea. Uh, management adaptation. So how do we continue to manage different species with a year of limited data? So a lot of effort went into that in 2020. Uh, collaboration, making sure that we're reaching out with our partners in the state of Alaska, um, who in, in some cases were able to get out and collect some information in 2020, working with our uh, collaborative partners at universities, um, in communities, and uh, we were quite successful at, uh, at getting information collected uh, this past year. We also uh, took the opportunity to press beyond some of the research development that we've done on uncrewed systems, electronic monitoring, and eDNA, as I've mentioned. Uh, and then lastly, and, and certainly not last, was a huge effort by our observer program uh, within the Alaska Fisheries Science Center to make sure that we supported uh, hundreds of observers that uh, were able to go out in the commercial fishing vessels, work with the commercial fishing industry, on uh, protocols to make sure that we're safe in the, in the time of a pandemic and collect as much information as we could. And uh, really a phenomenal effort on the fisheries part, communities part, and on the observer programs part in order to make sure that that happened this year. And then uh, lastly, in terms of challenges, I'd be remiss not to continue to mention the importance of climate change, the importance of environmental changes, um, and the challenges in the Gulf of Alaska are uh, not new uh, to Kodiak. They're not new to the coastal communities in Alaska. And I just want to highlight that here as we continue to work on collecting data to better understand the impacts that it has on the fisheries resources. You can see here the uh, heat wave index uh, that we've developed. And I'll put a couple of uh, links in the chat box when I'm wrapped up here. And you can go to this website. Um, but basically, the yellow bars here represent um, where we've statistically determined that, that we're experiencing heat wave. Um, and, and that is abnormal heat um, in the atmosphere, abnormal heat that's um, into the water column. And what you can see in two, from 2014 to current, we've had a number of long periods of heat waves. This has had dramatic impacts on the uh, marine environment. Um, again, as most fisheries communities know and understand. Uh, the the um, one example uh, that stands out is the cod collapse in the Gulf of Alaska. You can see in the top line here in this graph on the right-hand side, this is the, the female spawning biomass. And you can see how it was increasing after uh, 2010 and um, plummeted in uh, uh, correlation with the heat waves. And uh, similarly, the catches followed uh, based on our management principles. Uh, you can see here, this shows age zero recruits on this bottom graphic. And you can see the last handful of years where those recruits were extremely small. Without going into a ton of detail and uh, Steve Barbeau's research here, you know, we were able to tie a lot of these trends back to food uh, for Pacific cod, back to the lipid content, uh, back to the metabolic demands that the fish have uh, when the water is warmer and their subsequent low condition. Uh, what this means is that, um, you know, we do expect uh, future heat waves uh, to increase with climate change. And it means we need to know more about the ecosystem. We need to continue uh, conducting these surveys to better understand how the ecosystem um, relates to the commercial species and other marine mammal species that we, um, we manage and we focus on. 
So taking a step back to 2020, I wanted to highlight a few things that we were able to do um, regardless of the pandemic. And uh, uh, again, kudos to the staff that were able to make these uh, surveys happen. Uh, we collected data in the uh, Gulf of Alaska and in the Aleutians on the uh, longline survey. So we were able to collect critical information, um, especially on those cod species and, and other species of importance um, in the Gulf of Alaska in 2020. Um, not only are we focusing on the biology of uh, sable fish, uh, collecting information on length and weight and maturity, um, we're also tracking uh, sperm whale observations and their impacts on our survey and their distribution, uh, temperature along the deeper part of the water, and lots of information on other species and uh, rockfish and, and shark and granite deer in particular. Also in 2020, we were able to uh, conduct our Southeast Alaska Coastal Monitoring Survey. And uh, this is an ecosystem survey where we're able to uh, conduct surface trawl data, uh, surface trawls in order to uh, provide catch data on uh, salmon, for instance, forage species. Uh, we work with the state of Alaska on this survey. Um, this uh, provides information on a long-term pink salmon harvest forecast in Southeast Alaska, uh, where you can see here um, where the, the forecast um, has, has uh, occurred with the survey data over time. And you can see our ability to predict um, the pink salmon uh, returns based on the forecast created from this survey. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we prioritize that and we were able to do this particular survey safely from within um, the inside passage around the Juneau region and um, uh, collect those data that pro we provide to our ecosystem status reports provide information on salmon biology and um, some oceanographic indices. Another highlight of 2020 is going back to this innovative technology using sail drones. So when it became apparent that we weren't going to be able to uh, go out with our uh, typical um, bottom trawl surveys with our uh, typical NOAA uh, ship vessels with acoustics and assess the Pollock resource, um, our staff thought way in advance, uh, you know, back March a year ago, and, and thought about how we could use the drone technology. We had been already conducting years worth of research and development on this. It's not a replacement for sending out the ships. We, we need to collect biological data, and we need to touch the fish and get information uh, from the fish. But in a year such as a pandemic, this was a huge effort. In the end, we sent multiple sail drones from Almeida, California, thousands of miles across the North Pacific to the Bering Sea, conducted an acoustic survey um, overlapping with where we would typically conduct a survey, and ultimately were able to provide estimate numbers to the stock assessment process at the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Um, this was no small feat. It was not an inexpensive feat. Um, um, but it was an, an incredible effort and successful effort to provide data and uh, support the coastal communities in Alaska, to support the commercial fisheries in Alaska uh, in a year where that was a difficult task. Um, next, I wanted to focus for a moment just on the ecosystem data. We were also able to work with our, lots of our partners and uh, collect information associated with ecosystems. Uh, we were able to get information from our oceanography uh, colleagues on uh, the sea surface temperatures, which helps us understand what the fisheries may be doing, um, understanding what might be going on with age zero walleye pollock and Pacific cod. Um, the shifts in the salmon catches uh, provides information about ecosystems and what might be happening in uh, different parts of Alaska. Um, and the changes in the size composition of the copepods, the food, help us better understand what we might be able to predict in the way of um, successful recruitment in other species. This information all goes into our ecosystem status reports, and we produce these each year in each of these regions, the Gulf, the Aleutian Islands, and the Bering Sea, and they are provided to, to the management process. Uh, some of them, uh, most of them used uh, qualitatively, some of them used quantitatively to help us better manage these species. And um, there's a link there to a website that has a whole plethora of information that we use um, on the ecosystem to, to better manage our, our stocks. Again, I'll stick that in the, that link in the chat box here in a moment. 
Um, so let's look forward. 2021, Gulf of Alaska. I'm not going to show the whole state. I'll be here for hours. But um, just real quick focus on the Gulf of Alaska here. Apologize, this is kind of a busy slide. But on the left-hand side, I'm showing all the different surveys that we have going on in, in the Gulf of Alaska. These are years across the top, 2010 through 2021. Everything in green is something that we we did or are intending to do. Everything in red is something that we were not able to do and would have liked to have done. Uh, you can see uh, in the beginning here, this is our bottom trawl survey in the Gulf of Alaska. In 2020, we weren't expected to be in the Gulf, uh, so we didn't miss anything last year. We do intend to be and are planning to be in the Gulf of Alaska with two vessels this year, uh, similar to what we've done in recent years. Um, our our uh, slope longline survey is moving forward uh, for 2021. Uh, we just wrapped up our acoustic survey in um, uh, the Shalikov region. Uh, so we were able to get that survey. I'll show you a couple track lines here in a moment. We did not do the entire Gulf of Alaska survey, but we covered the region most important for stock assessment. Um, we collected some extremely important information on a recruiting year class that's out there right now. We were able to verify its presence. Um, this will be uh, very important for the um, management process. Um, our acoustic trawl survey in the summer. Uh, we haven't done a larval survey in a number of years. And the uh, bottom surveys are uh, more of our ecosystem surveys, our close to shore surveys out of the Kodiak Laboratory. Um, our work in the Evo spill area on oceanography and forage fish, and, and those efforts are, are moving forward for 2021. Oops. Um, this slide just shows real briefly uh, the survey that was just finished up, and uh, these show the intended track lines. These aren't the final track lines. Uh, the Oscar Dyson was able to safely deploy in um, the, the Shalikov region in particular, our staff were able to come through, shelter in place for weeks at home, shelter in place for weeks in Kodiak, get on the vessel and, and safely conduct um, the survey on, on Pollock in the Gulf. So last slide here on looking forward, uh, we've got a lot of irons in the fire moving forward. And I uh, apologize, this keeps switching back and forth here. It's a little, little lag. But um, we're working on a 22 through 26 strategic plan at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Um, this has a lot of new pieces to it. Um, as uh, both Mike and I have highlighted the importance of ecosystem research, the importance of climate research in our ability to manage the marine ecosystems. Um, socioeconomics and the value of understanding how um, uh, fisheries management decisions um, uh, climate change is affecting coastal communities and affecting um, commercial fisheries, bycatch, uh, some focus on the Arctic and uh, some renewed focus in mariculture. Um, there's a number of different focal strategies. You can see a few of them here on the right-hand side. I've provided a link if you're interested in more information. And this is from NOAA. Uh, NOAA's focus on artificial intelligence, intelligence omics. Um, this is partially part of that eDNA story I told you about uncrewed systems, citizen science, all very important topics for how we conduct business in Alaska. Um, from the National Marine Fisheries Service perspective, which is within NOAA, uh, climate ready fisheries, ecosystem fisheries management, you're hearing a similar theme here, and resilience in the U.S. seafood and fishing sector, uh, a high focus for National Marine Fisheries Service, especially this year with uh, the pandemic. Uh, we continue to support our surveys as our most important and basic uh, empirical data collection uh, through the center. And lastly, and, and I wish I could spend hours talking about this, is collaboration. Collaboration with the communities, um, as, you know, especially those of you who are attending ComFish and those of you who know how important communities are to um, and industry is to uh, research and science in Alaska. Um, uh, our focus on a tribal liaison position at the center, as well as our engagement with uh, indigenous communities throughout Alaska, which has become especially important as um, our resources are shifting, as our need to focus in different areas is shifting, as the environment is affecting communities' uh, ability to um, depend on subsistence resources. And last slide, I promise. Um, I just really wanted to put a plug in here for a report that is out right now. 
Um, this report was just finished up. It's going to be highlighted at the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council um, next week and the week after. I've provided the link in the upper um, right-hand corner here, or you can go to the council website. Um, and this is a series of uh, socioeconomic assessments of communities in Alaska. And I'm not gonna go into details here. I've, I've shown some of the pictures here focused on Kodiak. Um, everything from looking at the school district to uh, fisheries information on uh, landings, on uh, how much, um, how many dollars make it into the community versus out of the community, what the sectors look like, and you know, a real look at the importance of commercial fisheries to the communities of Alaska. And this is the kind of information that is absolutely critical that we get right. We have a better understanding for decisions that we're making as management bodies, um, but then also the impacts that environmental changes have on the different communities. And um, this is a dialogue that we need to continue uh, and support this kind of data collection. So I'm really excited about this and kudos to the authors and I hope folks can reach out and, and check those out. So um, that's all I have and I'm gonna drop a couple of um, uh, links in the chat box uh, while we're answering questions. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much. We don't currently have any questions at this point in time, but we do have a little bit of a lag between the presentation time and what our attendees hear. So we'll go ahead and just issue that reminder that if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat box on the forum stage or in the Q&A area. We can go ahead and take questions as they come in. And I see that your your getting those links sent out to the audience. So we'll wait just a moment to see if any questions come in. And still seeing none at this point in time, we'll, we'll still continue to wait a bit. But if both of you could go ahead and let any of our attendees, especially those that are maybe watching a recorded version of this presentation at a later date, if you can let them know how to get in touch with you with any questions that they might have. Yeah, sure, Sarah. Um, you know, we can both be re uh, reached by uh, going on to the Alaska Fishery Science Center website. Um, and uh, both uh, Mike's and my contact information are there. Um, you could also look on the NOAA um, our, um, locator site. Uh, my email is robert.foy at noaa.gov. Um, Mike, uh, I don't want to get yours wrong, so I'll let you say that. Um, but uh, yeah, there's many ways you can go about reaching us, and we'd be glad to address any questions folks have about the presentation or, or our mission in Alaska. Yeah, I just dropped it in the chat box, my, my email address, Sarah. I don't know if that'll come through for anyone looking at the recorded version, but mike.litzo, L-I-T-Z-O-W. And I always like to hear from folks in Kodiak, you know, or, or wherever. Outstanding. We've got that link. Let me see if anything else has come through here. Uh, yes, we have our first question from Jamie Gowen. Great presentations, Bob and Mike. Can you speak more to what you envision for climate-ready fisheries and what stakeholders can be doing, particularly for crab? Yeah, well, Jamie, great questions and uh, very much on our mind. And I guess, um, you know, I can say that we're, we're sort of in the plan developing stage um, in, in terms of what kind of research we want to conduct going forward for crab fisheries. But one thing that we really benefit from in the shellfish program is we've got really good uh, collaborations, really good relationships with industry groups like the Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation, like the Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers. And, um, you know, I really see fisheries as a, a linked um, ecological social system. You can't just study the, the, this, the hard science side, you know, the, the population biology side. It's very much a, a people story as well. And, you know, I think the, the history is you watch different fisheries around the world dealing with accelerating climate change and accelerating threats. It's the fisheries that have those, those strong relationships that do best. So certainly my version going forward is to, to work with industry 
from the outset and not to have a model where we sort of do our research off on the side and then come out with our answers and hand them out to people. We really want to, to involve industry at, at, at the beginning. So I don't have anything more specific than that, but that's sort of the organizing principle that we're going to move forward with. And I would just add to that, I, I completely agree. And as we move forward as a science organization, we're going to need to put more effort into our predictive capacity to understand how climate is going to check, uh, affect our ecosystems and, and our fish stocks. And that's gonna mean um, more information. That's gonna mean that we make sure that we continue to monitor these stocks in, in these uh, marine ecosystems and that we um, communicate what our expectations are moving forward. Um, the key is going to be flexibility. The management system we have right now is, is based on um, theories of, of static uh, productivity in our ecosystems. And I think we're going to have to better embrace flexibility in, in this process as we learn uh, just how our ecosystems are going to be affected. And, and, and really, um, it's not a mystery. We've already seen it happen. You know, we've watched cod and pollock stocks shift a thousand kilometers in the northern Bering or to the northern Bering Sea over the course of a year or two, um, and those are, are are shifting, maybe shifting back now. Um, but that's a good example. That and the the cod crash in the in the Gulf of Alaska are great examples of how we need to get try to get ahead of that, um, and and have better understanding of the processes in these systems so that we can. Um, help communities and commercial fisheries, and as Mike said, in collaboration with you, um, figure out what's what's coming in the future. Great question, Jamie. Thanks. Thank you so much. I haven't seen any additional questions come through at this point in time, um, but we we do have just another minute. If either of you have anything you'd like to just add to your presentations today. Yeah, I'll go ahead um, and I'll, I'll just sort of share an observation about um, working in fisheries in this community, which is that, um, you know, I first came here during the whole um, stellar sea lion groundfish closure, you know, and it was a really stressful time uh, for this town as a fishing community. And I came you know, with my wife as two federal fisheries biologists and that, you know, that would seem like a setup for a really rough time, you know, but the the reaction I got from people I knew in town is, is this really strong sense that um, Kodiak had been let down by not having good enough science and, and people in the industry really wanted better science and better research and were super welcoming to that. And so I've, I've always found that to be um, one of the great parts about living and, and working in this community. And and so I'm, you know, this is part of it, these kinds of events, and, um, and I'm looking forward to just continuing those relationships going forward. And nothing major to add, Sarah, just real happy to be able to participate in Comfish. Um, you know, I'm not always able to travel uh, back to what I, my, my kids and I still call home in Kodiak and, um, uh, not able to travel back there very often. So I'm, I'm one good thing about the uh, pandemic is the, the virtual nature of this. So I'm, I'm real happy to be able to participate and look forward to seeing folks back there sometime soon. Well, thank you. I know the community appreciates both of you joining us today. I'm sure you've seen in the comments uh, what big fans of both of you they are. And so thank you so much, both Bob and Mike, for taking time to keep us updated on the really important work that you both do today. Sure thing. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care, sir. As a reminder, all the forums you heard this week wouldn't have been possible without the generosity of our sponsors, which are listed in the chat and below this presentation. We'll be back soon at 345, where we will be joined by Gemma with Alaska Airlines. She's going to be doing our, we're going to do our door prize drawings together. And of course, Gemma is going to draw our ultimate grand prize winner of two tickets with Alaska Airlines. Maybe that will uh, be able to uh, get you to come visit us again, Bob. <laughs> All right. I like it, it sounds like a plan. <laughs> We will see everyone back here at 345 to give away some great prizes. Thanks so much.